slideshow? Meeting slideshow? Gotcha. Okay. Well, hello. Uh, I'm not Robert Circus, but uh, actually, uh, Robert couldn't make it tonight because he and his wife are going out and celebrating her one year anniversary of remission. Yeah, definitely, definitely uh, worth going and celebrating, so. Um, so we've, uh, well, slideshow? Your slideshow? Hey, there we go. Well, I think we all know we're in a meeting, so next slide. <laughs> uh, you know what, I'll tell a story while this is going on. So it was Tuesday night, and the board is on the phone, the board is on a, a meeting, and we're sweating this out, because we're looking at uh, the, the weather on the 18th, and just seeing what the weather's like, seeing what the forecast is like, and it's just killing us. And the decision was made, uh, if the weather is still looks bad for Saturday, uh, the 18th, uh, the next morning, then we'd call it. And so that's what we did, because that's what the forecast still looked like. And lo and behold, Saturday, the skies parted. So it gave us the astronomy gods uh, another reason to laugh at us. And uh, so, okay, I'm done with my story now. But what we're all going to cross our fingers for is that the 25th is going to be good to us. So I want to welcome our new members. Um, we've got uh, Constantine Bakintas. Is he here? If you, if you want to stand up and talk about why you want to, you know, what you're, what you're looking for in the club. And sure. Uh, you probably, most of remember Rob introduced me last week as well. And this is one of the guys for many years in this book in uh, astronomy. And I'm just now getting into it. I got my first starter stove and then uh, just now be learning it. Uh, so there's a lot to learn. These guys are, yeah, amazing. So thank you. Right on. Well, welcome. And we also have Alan Browning and family. Are they here? Okay, well, are they on Zoom? Well, they've joined the club, and we welcome them. So, uh, next slide. Hmm? Oh, really? These are the only names that I got? Gotcha. Okay, well, we'll circle around and hit that. So, the executive board. No worries, man. No worries. Okay, our executive board uh, consists of the president, Bob Circus, uh, myself, Bill Hall, uh, John Germini, who is the treasurer, uh, Monica Merritt, who is uh, the secretary, uh, Phil Stage, Robert Cargill in the back, uh, Bruce Campbell, our newest addition, uh, Zach Smith, and Cy Simonson. So next slide. And the key contacts we have here, uh, there's a, we have a development committee with these individuals, Michelle Thiessen, Tom Roth, Robin, Zach, Robert, Shane, and Bruce, and uh, a public outreach group, which actually includes both uh, Patrick McMahon and John McRae. Uh, John McRae is uh, in charge of Tandy Hills. And uh, Tom Roth is our representative for the Palo Pintos Mountain State Park. And we've got Thompson Observatory. Uh, our connection there is uh, Jerry Becker. 
and George Lutz has taken over the website management. So uh, next slide. So this is our history. We've been around since 1949, and uh, we've got, I think, 184 members now, and uh, we're one of the biggest uh, clubs in the United States, and uh, we're nonprofit, and there's more information on the website. Next slide. Oh, well, it's me again. So the, uh, the slideshow for what's in the sky. So this is for uh, everything that's going on from tonight until the next meeting. And what we have featured here, you know what? I'm going to turn the light off. So this is Trevor Bray's effort with the Seagull Nebula. I don't know if this was inspired by uh, uh, my feature of the Monoceros constellation last month, but whatever the case, this is uh, a really pretty rendering of it. Uh, next slide. So we got a new moon tonight, and uh, I don't know if it's cloudy or not, but uh, so uh, next slide. So, yeah, it's, it's kind of nice when these things uh, kind of overlap on the actual night of the meeting because it's a couple of slides that we saw last month. Uh, Cirrus is in opposition tonight, so it's as close as it's going to be to the Earth all year long. Uh, next slide. And like I said before, our, uh, our open house is rescheduled for this Saturday, the 25th. And uh, let us pray. We share our knowledge with people. We keep our optics clean. We open up our skies, your skies, to others' eyes. Please let us have clear skies on Saturday. Thank you. Next slide. <laughs> we got full moon on Wednesday, April 5th. It's not the favorite moon. That's why he's sad. Next slide, please. So we got Mercury in greater eastern elongation. And that means that it's up in the evening. Um, it's going to be 18 degrees up in the sky at highest, which is right at sunset. An interesting thing about this one that I haven't seen is magnitude figure for Mercury in just any time that I've looked at the stats for this stuff, and it's as bright as Vega. So I don't recall it ever being as bright as Vega before. Uh, so I don't know if that's different or not, but it's going to be as bright as Vega. Next slide, please. Okay, so <laughs> we're already at the constellation, which uh, means there's not a whole lot going on celestially this month, but it's going to start ramping up. We're going to start seeing more meteor showers. We're going to start seeing more stuff. So we're going to talk about Leo the Lion. So I was, uh, I was looking at uh, the other constellations that crossed the median, uh, for the next few weeks, and there's Sextons, and there's Leo Minor, and I don't know if you've ever looked up those constellations, but there's nothing in those constellations. So, here we are with Leo. Um, Leonis, which is the genitive name, which uh, they use for stars like Alpha Leonis, Beta Leonis, Leo's the IAU abbreviation, and it literally stands for lion, the name. Uh, it's, it's actually representing the Nemean lion in Greek mythology, but as early as 4000 BC, the records of uh, you know, a lion being associated with uh, this 
constellation, this grouping of stars, and it's because it looks like a lion, unlike, I don't know, a unicorn. <laughs> so it is a very recognizable thing in the sky. Um, 13 stars with known planets, uh, 13 named stars, including Denebola and Regulus. Uh, so next slide. So about Regulus, so it's a triple star system. And uh, the brightest star, the primary star, the one that we see in the sky with our naked eye, um, it's a really young star. It's only a few million years old and uh, it spins really fast. So the fun fact about Regulus is if it were rotating 16% faster, it would blow apart like its own gravitational force couldn't hold it together. So it's kind of a flat, it's kind of a flat star. Fun fact. So uh, next slide. Wolf 359, it's a terrible battle there with the Borg, many lives lost, very tragic, very tragic. It's only 7.78 light years away from us, so it's very popular, it's a red dwarf, it's a very popular star that's used in a lot of science fiction. Um, it's about as small as a, a star with thermonuclear fusion can get, and uh, it's only about 8% the mass of our sun, and it's about the size of Jupiter. It's really just about as small as a, a star can be. Next slide. The Leonids. By the way, I'm really having a lot of fun with PowerPoint. It's <laughs> great. So uh, uh, the Leonids, uh, every November, mid-November, 17th and 18th, it's the storm that's known for the meteor, or the shower that's known for the meteor storms uh, every 33 years. So that, uh, that comes out of inside the sickle here. Next slide. Tis galaxy season. It's actually really when Leo and its friends Coma Berenices, Canis Venetici, and Virgo are really high in the sky that we really say it's galaxy season starting. Very exciting time. So uh, you see that it's just this load of galaxies right here. It's, it's the mother load. Next slide. So there's this group of galaxies, um, a couple of uh, Messier objects and a new general catalog object that are actually uh, gravitationally involved with each other. We got Messier 65, 66, and 3628, and this is famously known as the Leo triplet. And this little picture right here, next slide, is George Lutch's fine handiwork of, uh, of the triplet. And uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Next slide. So, Messier 65, it's a, it's a dying galaxy. There really isn't a whole lot of gas and dust. Probably not going to see any new life, relatively speaking, to it unless it had another uh, galaxy collision. Uh, so, it's got really old stars, and um, oh yeah, it's, it's, it's on its way out, relatively speaking. Next slide. So we got Messier 66, so this is a barred spiral, and it's about the size of our own galaxy, and it's had four recorded supernovae since they've been recording supernovae. Next slide. And then there's the Hamburger Galaxy. So 3628, it's a beautiful galaxy. It's got this huge, thick dust lane right there, and it's just a... A really cool galaxy to image and, and see in the, in the, see in the eyepiece. So next slide. So we have Leo 1. So this is uh, M96 group. This is another trio of galaxies uh, bound by gravity. Uh, it's uh, got 
M95, M96, and M105. Next slide. So this is compliments of our own Richard Hoffman. And next slide. These, these three galaxies that we're talking about. So next slide. So M95 is uh, a really cool galaxy. It's got this 2,000 light year diameter ring that's almost perfectly round here. And uh, this, is, this is actually a, a, a ESO's a very large telescope rendering of it. Next slide. So there's M96. And this is a double barred spiral. And if nobody's heard of a double barred spiral, it's actually a spiral galaxy, a bar spiral galaxy that actually has an inner bar and an outer bar that may not even be on the same axis. So uh, there isn't a whole lot of information about it, but it's just an interesting structure. Uh, I think it might be from a, uh, maybe a galactic collision. Don't know. So next slide. So we got M105 here. This is a barred lenticular galaxy. Lenticular basically just meaning that it's still got a disc, disc, disc shape and uh, uh, not a whole lot of structure. It's kind of an uh, evolution of a galaxy in between a, a spiral and an um, elliptical. So uh, it's surrounded with its, uh, uh, with its little uh, companion here. It's actually surrounded by an enormous ring of hydrogen uh, called the Leo ring. So if you've ever heard of the Leo ring, that's what's going on here. And it's probably just like halos are, results of collisions with galaxies. So uh, next slide. NGC 3842. So it's an elliptical galaxy, but the cool thing about it, I mean, it's not really a special eyepiece galaxy. I mean, you can see it, and that's fine. Next slide. No, not next slide. Uh, it's uh, uh, the black hole in the center is the thing that's notable. And I can't get my head wrapped around the idea of a black hole having a mass of 9.7 billion solar masses. So next slide. And there's a bigger picture of it. There's a black hole right there. Can't see it. Next slide. And then there's UI.27, uh, the, other <laughs> the other moniker for this is the huge, large quasar group. And uh, maybe it can be seen by the very large telescope. I don't know why they do that, but <laughs> anyway, so it's quasar group, and uh, it's considered, if, it's cons if, if it is a structure, basically where all these quasars are associated with each other, that it's the third largest known structure in the known universe. So uh, no matter what, it's just a whole lot of quasars in a little spot, or a huge large, huge large spot. Next slide. So uh, there's a listing of 832 deep sky objects in LEO. Uh, as you can see on the Sky Live, uh, they've got a really great database. Of, of information about constellations and their contents. Uh, same thing with the constellation-guide.com. And next slide, like I always tell y'all, keep looking up. <laughs> this right here, this right here is uh, Jim Potts, a uh, little rendering of, uh, it's a RGB true color of the Crab Nebula. All right, so that's that, and um, it's time for uh, monthly reports. So should I just keep the lights off because we're actually going to be using the screen, or maybe I can just be over here and man the lights while, you know, people are reporting and need the screen. Please watch your eyes.
I don't know if that's necessary. I kind of liked the dark. Isn't that what we do? We like the dark. So uh, outreach report. Uh, Patrick, if you've, where's our other microphone? Oh, our other microphone is being used. Okay. Let me, let me come to you. All right, um, just a few things. We got some uh, star parties uh, coming up. I'm a little disorganized today, I apologize, but we got some next week. Uh, I know I got one that's mainly gonna be solar viewing, being springtime, so at least get people to look at the uh, sun and maybe we can talk about the eclipses coming up. Our next Dinosaur Valley State Park will be in April. I'll post more as we get closer to that. And as always, I'll post on these e-groups, so if you guys want to have help, just let me know. Thanks. Thank you very much. I don't know. Oh, shit. I want to be on camera. So we've made some significant prog process, progress, there you go, at Rising Star, so I wanted to highlight those activities um, for the development. Um, Development Committee report, so is there a presentation? And do you want to video first? Or uh, let's go with the video, that'd be great. So, where's the mobile microphone hold for your camera? Is this better? Yeah, better, better. Great. So we're gonna start off the presentation with a drive um, on starting on the county road outside our facility, uh, County Road 244 and we're gonna turn into our new gate and then take the new path through the woods to our observing field. Um, so let's hit it. Woo! And so here we go, and boom! <laughs> So um, one of the things that the board also reviewed last Tuesday was uh, funding a skid steer to clear the um, trees through the mesquite forest for us. And uh, it was a really good investment. We, the project was uh, finished in six hours, which I estimated it would have taken us two months with a team of people and costing us a, a zillion dollars in gas to drive back and forth. But um, the board saw the wisdom in, in funding um, that project, and so um, we've accomplished what we needed to do. We have our own gate. We can access the observing field. Um, we have the open house come uh, this weekend, and then there's the Rising Star is open for you to come out and use to your heart's content. So um, I think we're done with the video. Let's go to the presentation. Uh, not that one. Um, layout, layout, layout. Which one? Layout? No. It was, it was the development committee video, I mean, uh, presentation. I, uh, I never got into that. Oh. Can you put it on? So I'm looking at my counter. Oh, he didn't start it. So can we start it now? Okay. <laughs> so development committee report, last one, or that one, yes. So third slide, go down to the third slide. But I've got to fix this every time. So I'm trying to uh, give you an idea of uh, the progress that we made um, to get to where we are today at Rising Star, uh, doing some before and after images. So when you can, go to the next slide. So before showing the, the where we decided to put our entrance at uh, County Road 244, uh, it's right next to the James James's property. Um, but after uh, clearing the trees out of the way and having somebody come in and do the uh, dirt work and then put in the base so we can have a nice driveway. Um, there you see what 
the work that was accomplished from the before picture to the after picture. And the pecan tree it, uh, remains in place. Let's go to the next slide. And then how did we get through the mesquite trees? Well, we, we picked a, a pathway um, that had the minimum number of trees so we could leave more trees um, in, in the forest. Um, and what we decided to do was instead of taking 290 degrees to get through the uh, forest, as we did, we only took 45 degrees. And it turns out there were two 45, in each of those lanes, there were a minimum number of trees. So we did that and then had the skid steer come out and uh, yank up the trees by their roots, because if you don't get mesquite trees by their roots, they just come back with a vengeance. Next slide. Okay, the observing field, uh, for those of you, everyone that's been out there, uh, either on a work day or out observing, you had, had to be careful where you step because we had a number of ruts that were most likely created by wild hogs. Um, and it, it also makes a significant a challenge driving over them because each of your tires rock the driver significantly as you go through. But using the skid steer, we were able to bring uh, soil that was on site and fill in the, these ruts. And that's what I'm trying to show here on this picture, on the after picture. And then the skid steer compacted the, the soil. So by and large, um, all of our major ruts have been repaired. Next. And then to give you an idea what the observing field looked like when we purchased the property, it had a number of small mesquite trees on them. Uh, it was also loaded with cactus. Um, there, through quite a few work days, uh, cactus was removed. And I can't imagine what those people were thinking as they pulled those cactuses out, chopped them out. I know what they were thinking, why, why am I here? Because it was hard work. Um, but, they, but they kept coming back and we got nearly all the cactus the currently growing cactus out of the field. We know we're gonna to have to have a maintenance program to make sure they don't come back, but the cactus is gone, the mesquite trees are gone, they've been dug up or removed. And the farmer had previously burned the field, and so we had a number of stumps, small stumps, two inches in diameter and um, smaller, that were nothing more than trip hazards. Uh, so those have been um, mostly removed along with the limbs the charred limbs that were left over from burning the trees. Okay, and then here's another look. I cut and paste, the wrong one. But anyway, this is another look at the uh, field from the northwest corner into the observing field, but um, happy to report that nearly all of the uh, field is in pretty good shape. There's a, about a 20 foot sector at the east end that hasn't been mowed, so that's currently um, not Used, can't be used for observing, but we'll, we'll get to that one. And then um, did want to make this notice. Uh, we have a new entrance, we have a new gate, and we also have a new lock. And this is what it looks like. Um, and what's significant about it is instead of being the combo here to get in, it's the one up here. So the key that I remember is you have to hold the lock so you can read the word master, and then you enter the combo um, as close as you can to the master. The, the combination hasn't changed. We have a new lock, but the combination hasn't changed. And one, two, three, four is not the combo, just so you know. Uh, to get the gate combo, go to the E groups, go to that folder, go to that file name, and you can get the combo. And then uh, the development committee has a number of projects we're still working on, and our goal is to continue to make improvements at the Dark Sky site. Well done. Makes me want to buy some golf clubs. It's a nice look and feel. Okay, so Robert uh, Circus has actually addressed that issue. Uh, what he's sending out, if he hasn't already, he's planning on sending out is uh, not just uh, directions, but uh, geographical coordinates. So, um, and that's going out by email through the uh, uh, NSN site so that the entire membership gets it. But good question. 
So, uh, Palapinto Mountains. Anything going on at Pal Palapinto Mountains? Do you want to talk about the layout or not? Because I got this in the list. The layout. Oh, this is the layout for the open house. Um, you had sent me the layout. I didn't know if you wanted to. You want to speak to that real quick? Uh, so we wanted to give you an idea of what the layout looks like for the upcoming open house. Uh, this, was, this hasn't been approved, but this is um, our third, hasn't been uh, uh, approved by the board, but this is the third generation. So we're, we're planning to have uh, upwards of 150 people there or uh, up to 80 cars. And the way we're setting this up is we'll have two rows of scopes, essentially. Uh, those people participating in the Mezier Marathon will be on the west side of the property, um, on the north side, followed by the uh, Mezier group that's doing the full marathon. And then the rest of that area is going to be filled with astrophotographers. Then we're having this, what we're calling an astro lane. And the astro lane is where people will just walk up and down um, between the two uh, observing areas and, and perhaps take a look through people's scopes as they see what is um, uh, both our guests and our members can look through the scopes and see what is being looked at. We've had a, just a large number of members going to participate in the open house, and, and many of them are bringing scopes. So we're going to ask the people who uh, bring their scopes, uh, they'll, they'll be in that second row of uh, telescopes. And the way it's going to turn out is those people observing will have their vehicle next to them um, along with their telescope. And that way, once they get onto the, onto the site, park their car, they don't have to move. Um, same, same thing for the first row and the second row. And then all of our guests and members who don't bring scopes, they'll be parked in the, in the southwest corner. Um, the hub of activity will be here, not because the porta potties are here, but because this is just where we're going to be meeting. But it's important to note where the porta potties are. Um, uh, but the, during the day, um, after the gates open and before it gets dark, there's going to, be, going to be a telescope display in this area and as well as well as some solar scopes. And then the raffle ticket will be in this area, um, excuse me, the raffle ta table in place so people can buy raffle tickets. And then when they announce the winner of the raffle, it'll be in this area. Um, a couple people are bringing campers, including the person who's going to be cooking the food for us tonight, the hamburgers and hot dogs. And so I, 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 the way I envision it is they'll have the food here, they'll then cook it here, have it available, and then people will uh, eat in the general assembly area or just go back to their cars where their equipment is. Um, and when we came, just, just to show you where we're at, this is the entrance onto the field. Uh, County Road 244 is just to the west. Um, and the, not, the, the, the rationale for all of this happening is so as people leave, they can just head to the exit through one of these um, south, middle, the Astro Lane, or the North Road. And it's not really a road, it's just the observing field, but that's how we're going to be traveling. Any questions? How large is this area? This is about uh, 3.6 acres. Any other questions? Good, thank you. Thank you, Bruce. So work at the state park is progressing. They're working on the roads and a soft opening by the end of the year and open to the public uh, first quarter of 2024. Um, we are clearing hiking trails. They're going to put 12 miles of hiking trails in at the moment. So I've been going out there about once a week and clearing brush off hiking trails. So if anybody doesn't go to the gym and they want a good workout, <laughs> I can guarantee you you'll get a good workout out there. So uh, that's it's going if you're a hiker or whatever, it's going to be great trails. Uh, the trains kind of rough and they'll smooth it out a little, little bit, but it's not going to be groomed. It'll be fun to hike out there. So there you go. Very cool. Thank, Thank you, Tom. Tom.
Okay, uh, I know we don't have anything to vote on tonight, but does anybody have any announcements? Uh, when, when are we going to discuss the changes to the bylaws? No, we're not going to discuss that tonight, uh, mainly because Cy is not attending. Uh, so I think that he was, I think that what he said was he's going to, well, this is really messing with me, that he's going to um, address it at the uh, uh, April meeting when the vote happens. What? Oh, he's here. He's in the little. He's in the little box. He's in the box over there. What are you online? I don't know. Was there a specific question? Gotcha. Okay. Uh, it was. It was about uh, if there was any discussion about the changes or anything. Is there really anything new or? Has that really already been brought up in a prior meeting? So what we discussed last month wasn't any uh, restructure. It was what we were voting on actually not the executive process. The public is going to have a prime focus. That is exactly what we're going to vote on at the April meeting. And if we have some other things that we need to change, we can figure out what some changes are. So just a couple things right there. One is going to be the uh, NYPD and all that. We'll address them in the future. But this is one of the things that we need to get done so we can Okay. Any other questions? Any other announcements? Great, thank you. Thank you for pointing that out. And John actually put together an advertisement uh, for our, uh, our presence at the Tandy Hills. And I think we've actually got that in a slide. Um, if you wanted everybody to see that or I'm right on. So uh, I guess that's it. So, uh, you know, we wanna take a break for about 10 minutes, uh, get ready for uh, Sarah. Sarah's uh, presentation on getting ready for the solar eclipse. John. <laughs> okay, so on the E group in the files directory, there's one for Tandy Hills, you can go there and find a uh, pictorial uh, display of where we set up, how we get to that, the address, and so forth. Thank you, John. All right, we'll see you guys in 10 minutes. Watch your eyes. It's still gonna okay.
wide angle. It's almost like a fish shot. Slide for her. Okay. It's part of the meeting. Okay. Oh, okay. A meeting thing. Yeah. So. <laughs> check, check. But you don't want to use the level there? Oh, I'm going to use this. Okay. Oh, that just clicks on. Yeah, that's right. Yep. It's okay. If you need a laser. Okay. I won't. I brought my own, but oh, I, I won't. You brought your own. Yep. I brought a collimator. <laughs> this is the one that I use when I forget to ask if anybody brought one. Cool. Okay. Check, check. All right, ready to go again. <laughs> get this out of here. It's the meeting slides. All right. So... Tonight's presenter, her name is it's Twiddle, right? Twiddle. Twiddle. Sarah Twiddle. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay. She's a member of the club, but for over a decade, she was the manager of Noble Planetarium. Yes. And uh, she's uh, engaged, when she was with the planetarium, engaged in all sorts of uh, interaction association of planetariums. and Former. Former, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I did my four years. I'm when sure. you were there, yeah, yeah. Your, 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 your term, your obligatory term, right? But, um, yeah, so she's been really involved in um, uh, outreach, touching stuff. And tonight, uh, she's going to uh, talk about um, getting ready for the solar eclipse. So, here's Sarah. All right. I feel like I talk very loud, so I'm going to lower this a little bit. Um, so if you all haven't met the current planetarium manager in the room, there he is over there. There's Nick. Feel free to introduce yourself to him. <laughs> um, oh, sorry, yes. Get in the center here. There I am. All right, so go ahead and first slide. So that's a good overview of, of who I was and where I was. And I actually kind of got uh, the idea that I'm talking about tonight started in my head. I realized that not being at the planetarium anymore, my impact for this, uh, these upcoming solar eclipses, especially the total solar eclipse, is going to be very different. So I'm no longer in the dome. I'm now at home. What am I going to do? What resources do I have compared to what I thought I was going to have? And the resources are, are going to be a little bit different um, considering that I, I am just in my own neighborhood, so um, just a little overview. Um, actually, I don't feel like I need to do that overview anymore. I, I was just gonna say COVID kind of hit the museum a little hard. It got a few of the positions completely eliminated. Uh, about, I think, five or eight uh, full-time staff members no longer had a job after about six months of furlough. Um, but thankfully, they got us on unemployment very fast, so I am grateful to them for that. Um, but yeah, being at home means I do have a lot more freedoms than I expected to have in the planetarium industry. And if y'all want to talk with me about that, I am happy to chew your ear off or talk your ear off. There we go. Brain and words here. Uh, talk your ear off afterwards if you like. Next slide. Okay, so thinking about the transition of what resources I do have, I actually thought of this idea when I was walking with my son to his local preschool looking at my neighbor's homes, just seeing my neighbors as I went along and thought, really the biggest impact I can make for this upcoming, these upcoming eclipses uh, is that I don't want people to go blind. Ultimately, I want people's eyes to stay safe. A lot of misinformation will be out there for folks to listen to, unfortunately, and a lot of people will think that they are uh, financially sort of exempt from being able to view this safely for whatever reason. They might need, think they need equipment, which really they don't uh, need a lot. 
a cardboard box, pinhole projector, colander, you name it. Even some of the smallest pieces of equipment that they have at home currently can allow them to view it safely and enjoy it. But ultimately, I want them to walk away from me in a two-minute conversation knowing that they can view it safely. They don't have to endanger themselves, endanger their kids, endanger their eyes. And that's what, um, kind of rushing through this a little fast. Um, that's what basically the, if you click ahead, I'll make my you know, little three points up here. The why, don't, people don't go blind. That, that's my why for this upcoming, these upcoming eclipses. Um, the how, go ahead. The ripple effect. Honestly, I want to make very small things make a larger impact. If you talk to somebody, they hopefully will talk to somebody, they will talk to somebody. This effect really is, is bigger than you think. Um, so if you don't wanna think on the large scale, like I was trying to before, if you wanna think on the small scale, the large scale is maybe a little, just so far above your head makes you kind of anxious and worried about not being able to do enough. Little effects really can make a large impact. And with my limited time, limited resources now, with my two kids at home, um, I really need to make as much of an effect in the area around me. And the third point is basically, once again, talk to anyone who you don't want to go blind. That, that's your who. That, that is exactly who you need to talk to. But going a little bigger on that, of course, thinking about your own backyard, I want you guys to think about this. Who do you already know in your backyard? Where do you already have a foot in the door? Beyond this club, are you a part of a different club, a different organization? Uh, maybe just even a small group. It doesn't have to be big. Three plus people, honestly, is just enough to get sort of a foot in the door and the conversation started. And if you already know these folks, they know you, you already have an in to talk about this. Get five minutes in a meeting. Get five minutes in a group conversation. Start talking about it in group chats if you can. Um, in even just the most simple ways possible. Don't overload them like we nerds do with information. That's gonna be the easiest thing for all of us to do about the eclipses, um, but rather just hit the main points about safety, um, the numbers of people who are going to hit our area. That's another sort of safety point again. Uh, but safety of their eyes, safety of their area, and then if they wanna know more, that's great. That's another end of the conversation. And of course, however many people you know, they know more and they might want you to talk to more people. So really, or they could carry that message on to even more people beyond. Um, I say set it up now, honestly, I've been talking with a lot of people and they do say a lot of folks won't be terribly interested, and you may already know this, until about a month out. A lot of people won't worry about getting things on their calendar, worry about setting up you know, what they're going to do, how they're going to view the eclipse, um, or either of the eclipses coming up. Uh, but definitely get something set up within the three to one month mark of either eclipse, especially the total solar eclipse. That's gonna be the big one, uh, the one that has the most kind of uh, push behind it. I expect it to be similar to 2017. A lot of my colleagues expect it to be similar to 2017, so we'll see how true that is. All right, next slide. Just to help your brains kind of envision, okay, who do I know? Um, maybe you're just kind of stuck in your brain going, I, brain freeze, I, I, don't, I can't think of anyone at the moment. Uh, I'm gonna mention a few people I know that might seem unusual to reach out to. Um, for a little while there in the pandemic, like many parents, I considered homeschooling. Realized very quickly that me and my son will not work well that way. He does need a group of his peers in a very formal setting. He does enjoy formal education. Um, but through my research phase to figure out exactly how homeschooling could work, not only just for me and my son, but also what were the resources in my area, uh, there are a lot of homeschool parents I now have connections with, a lot of co-ops that I now have. Um, I'm on their chat groups. I'm on their communication um, uh, forums and such, so I can start reaching out to them. And these are the kinds of folks, these parents are very motivated to teach, whether it's just to themselves, to their kids, to other adults. They are engaged in education in a very deep way. 
Um, and some of them are even connected to nature schools. I didn't know that was a thing until I started doing a quick look around the area. But nature schools are another perfect audience for me to just quickly talk to, just to go out and say, here's what you can do with your students for these eclipses. They have a lot more freedom time-wise. Um, they're not restricted by formal school schedules and such. So hopefully with that information in their hands, they'll be able to just extend that education a little bit farther. And of course, the eclipses are a perfect STEAM activity. There are so many STEAM activities surrounding the eclipses um, that they'll probably be very excited about all, this, all these new resources. I am still connected to the Solar System Ambassador Program. And uh, there's a few around our area. I did look recently online. Uh, there are a few new SSAs. Um, there are a few like me who have been in the program over a decade now. Um, and I do plan to reach out just to the local ones, the ones here in Fort Worth, maybe as far as Irving, to see how I can bolster their events, how they can bolster my events, how we can share resources and communities, just to make an even sort of wider impact there. And of course, above and beyond all of this, there are a lot of uh, women in the play date groups um, that I have found for my one-year-old daughter, Naomi, to get her out of the house, get me out of the house, have her interact with other kids without paying, uh, you know, you know, out of the pocketbook way too much for daycare and such uh, that we can't afford anymore, honestly. <laughs> Um, there are a lot of women like me who have lost their careers either due to the pandemic, uh, due to the high cost of childcare, um, and careers not paying enough, honestly. There's a lot of that going on. So a lot of these women like me are looking for something to dig our teeth into. We're looking for something to give us that feeling of, of having that career again. So something a little bit outside of the house, uh, so we don't feel so singular anymore. As much as we're rocking the parent life, we do wanna, we wanna get out, we wanna do more. So I'm hoping to engage them and all of their expertise. There are some PhDs, masters, beyond that I know in this group of mom, uh, moms that, and it's primarily moms, there's maybe one or two dads that come around, um, that I know their expertise might surprise me and how it can be useful for arranging, organizing, and helping um, create even just small ripples, small events in the local area. All right, hopefully that inspired you guys to think about groups you know, but even if you don't know groups, maybe this is just your one thing, these are your people, this is your family, um, think about just uh, singular uh, established people in your area. I didn't know until recently that every neighborhood pretty much every neighborhood in Fort Worth has a neighborhood police officer, a beat officer I think is the other term for this, but NPO is the one term that they list on their website. And you can reach out to them and see exactly how they, how their role in your neighborhood can apply to things like block parties, um, maybe putting up signage in the local area where they would advise, uh, how they would advise you to engage with maybe the local neighborhood, the HOA, or um, even just the police force. See how you can educate um, those local entities to know more and be prepared, once again, for that onslaught, hopefully, of tourists that we'll get in the coming year. Uh, but even if you're not quite encouraged enough or maybe brave enough to call your MPO just yet, uh, maybe you are brave enough and you already know your district rep, your local uh, representative in the community. Uh, maybe you have a local business you're very tight with they do also need to know the onslaught of tourists are coming and that they need to possibly prepare their business for a huge spike in business or people trying to set up in their parking lot. Who knows? It's gonna be a little bit of chaos. Uh, libraries, of course, are great. I've been talking to my local one I go to with my kids all the time. I also go to print, uh, 3D print things there, so they really do know me. <laughs> And they haven't ha yet had a talk with Central Library yet, apparently. Uh, but I now have uh, one of the ladies there, I have her email address to send her more information so then she can share it with Central Library and they can maybe use some of the resources I know that might not be easy to find on their end or they might not even think about some of the things I might mention. Talk to a neighbor. If you have an HOA, I don't, and I'm very glad I don't, honestly. <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, I'm glad you guys echo that sentiment a little bit. Um, <laughs> they can be great, they can be terrible, they're a mixed bag. Uh, but if you have one that's relatively organized, that can do some good, feel free to reach out to them, do a quick five minute talk. Honestly, it doesn't have to be big. It, has, it can be as simple as don't go blind. Um, that, is, that is my pitch. Don't go blind uh, to just about anybody I meet. Uh, you can create a local event. You can talk to a community center. If you have a farmer's market in your area, this is just a cool bingo card I, I put together of ideas just in case you're like, well, who do I talk to? Where do I go to? And if you have a friend who does a lot better at sort of type A and a lot better at organizing things and talking to people, and that's not your strength, send whatever list you have as far as resources go to them. Push it off on them. <laughs> Encourage them. Once again, it doesn't have to be all about you. Uh, next slide. So just in case you're wondering how to contact your NPO, uh, the police department has that on their website. You can search the one address uh, search feature in their website. Next slide. Gives you that sort of look of what that page looks like. You can type in your own address in there and it will give you all the um, regional staff for your area, what their job does, who they are, what their history is. Um, and they should have an email address as well as a phone number for the NPO for your area. So next slide. Another resource is the uh, Community Engagement Office in Fort Worth. I highlighted the two I thought would be most important here. These uh, two resources, the Neighborhood Alliance and Neighborhood Association. Um, depending on your area, there's at least one or two meetings the Neighborhood Association has uh, per year. Maybe they have them quarterly, it just depends on the neighborhood. Uh, but now that we're just a little before a year out from the total solar eclipse, this is a great time to find out when that date is. And once again, ask them if you can have two, three, four, five minutes of that meeting time just to say, here, don't go blind. <laughs> All right, thank you, bye. Um, <laughs> Just, just pass along that, more resources, reach out to me. Um, yeah, we don't wanna bore them with too much information, but we wanna hit the high points of, of what they actually need to know, what's most useful for them. And that advice goes to, for anyone you reach out to, what is going to be most important to them. Not what's more, most important to you, it's very different sometimes, or it might be exactly the same, who knows, but think about how, what information could affect them most. Um, next slide. And uh, an action step that I am going to proceed with, besides printing out some of the bingo cards to hand out to people who are interested in doing outreach, uh, are printing out little uh, QR code business cards that lead to, I'm mean, working with the local as well as the larger uh, region of planetarium folks. I'm gonna present this at the upcoming meeting we're having. Uh, working on a very nice infographic of the top information for the public um, about the total solar eclipse for sure, um, as well as perhaps a secondary page for the annular solar eclipse, but definitely key solar eclipse information, once again, safety, uh, what, they, what an average person can do to see these events safely, um, if they wanna know more about the eclipse in general, just education of what's happening in the sky, that it's not scary, technically speaking. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm hoping to hand out a lot of business cards, so if nothing else, people can scan the QR code. I did have a friend recently mention, I could even put that QR code on a shirt, so I won't even have to talk to people. I can just pass by them, QR code on the back, they can scan me and go on their way. I like that idea. <laughs> um, yeah, so. Just in case, uh, maybe you haven't looked up the weather information. Some of you have, I've talked to a few of you guys. Some of you have looked up the weather information for the local region around the total solar eclipse. Um, but don't be too terribly worried about missing it from here if you stay local. If maybe you do wanna host a block party, maybe you do wanna host a local community event of some kind. Um, I looked up, next slide, some of the uh, weather data. Uh, I think this is all from Mr. Eclipse. At least that's the thing I typed into my Google search bar, but I'm sure you can also find some of these images. They're very zoomed in here, just to show Texas and that line going through us. 
Uh, but you can tell in 2017, a few clouds. 2018, horrible clouds. Next slide. 19 clears up a little bit, and 20 is perfectly clear. Next slide. But on average, I think this, is, this comes from about 50 years. At least I definitely saw a few other infographics that covered about 50 years of weather data. We're at a half chance of clouds. That's a very bad way of saying that, but you can kind of see. We're, we are not the worst location for clouds, likelihood for the upcoming eclipse, but we're not exactly the best either. But we're, we're right there in the middle grounds. Um, so you have just as good of a chance here as you do most places, I think, along uh, the Texas center line. Um, there are some places, if you zoom into that map, that will definitely be in the like the 30, 20 percent uh, area of likelihood of clouds, but it's not going to be too terrible. All right, next slide. Questions? I know I kind of maybe ran through that fast. I don't know. <laughs> Anyone have questions about how they feel like they can make a local impact, or maybe ideas? These are just some of my ideas. Awesome. Uh, just to keep that relationship going. Thank you. So what I was saying is all of my doctors and dentists know that I'm into astronomy, and I've told them the both of both eclipses that are coming our way, and I provided them with um, eclipse glasses um, so they will have them. Not that I expect better service from them, but it, it wouldn't <laughs> hurt. That's awesome. If I get some of those uh, business cards, would you like a few to pass out to other people? I, I think I'll, I'll do my own. But that, okay, sure. That was a great idea. Yeah. Did anyone think of a local group that they're a part of, they already have a foot in the door that they might talk to? Anyone think of a different kind of group than I mentioned up there? Okay, garden club, yes, definitely. Even if like you maybe have dogs that you walk with other people, go to the dog park, put up signs. <laughs> uh, I, I'm, uh, awesome. So you can talk to them, you can even like have your radio on, ready to go, transmit on the day of or days before. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else have questions or ideas that came to their minds? Hey, Sarah. I got a, yes. I got an addition to your reaching out to the communities. Remember, uh, one of the key ways to gain interest is point out it's an opportunity to monetize. <laughs> I got a little bonus, a little extra presentation here. Uh, for those that don't know me, my name is Juan Martinez, been a longtime member uh, since 2001. Uh, always been plugged in with, uh, with our outreach uh, work. And perfect opportunity, no time like the present, to uh, make a couple of announcements. A uh, lot, of, lot of exciting activities happening. Uh, we're, I'm, I'm throwing in my name in the hat, volunteering to lead up basically an Eclipse Committee. And if you recall, many years back, was it four or five years ago, well, we started uh, what, I, what I call Chris's I Have a Dream speech and uh, start, start our eclipse planning. And we canvassed our sibling uh, clubs. And so a lot of work uh, has been happening in the background. We've been uh, still continuing hope carrying that torch. Uh, so what does this mean? Uh, an eclipse committee. What I'd first like to identify, identify what it is and what it is not. What this committee is not at this point in time is any guarantee or invitation to host any specific meeting or eclipse event at any school or particular function. What it is, same spirit as Sarah saying, is to garner interest through information and preparedness. So several of us, uh, we, we, we have uh, the, what I call the usual suspects. Uh, uh, where's Patrick? Patrick's minions. 
uh, the, the core outreach group that frequents all of our schools, uh, park, state parks, libraries, and scout troops. Um, one announcement I'd like to make is that uh, I myself, uh, because I'm so passionate about this and I'm excited, I'm making a private donation of some Eclipse viewers uh, to circulate and distribute free at, at our recurring outreach events. And we currently have 5,000 units. They're stock Eclipse viewers. We have more on the way. Uh, we're, it's a combination of more stock units and custom printed ones with FOS logo for advertisement. Mr. Bruce, you're my hero. I think you're always looking out for us. You made an announcement in an email say, hey guys, uh, I already bought my gear. You guys better uh, get them while they're, before they're gone. We've all been monitoring all of the manufacturers, equipment of cardboard eclipse viewers, telescope filters, mounts. Prices are starting to go up. Availability is starting to dwindle. Uh, Bruce, thanks to you, we've decided, uh, the, the group, uh, the, the outreach group, we're going to go ahead and make some available to the general membership. You're not forgotten. Uh, right now, what we're considering is every, every uh, current member gets five free Eclipse viewers and we'll make additional available for purchase. And as far as outreach, the intent is free distribution. It would be advertisement for the club and the event. Worst case scenario, if there's any surplus, we may consider fundraising. It would be a modest fee. We want to get in front of the, the horror stories of price gouging and uh, the gray market knockoffs that we all experienced last at the last event. Uh, let's see, I got some bullets here. No, no PowerPoint presentation, just wanted to give you a quick uh, teaser of what's coming up, uh, happening later in the year. Uh, let's see, so on our, there, there of course will be, like today's topic, a monthly presentation. Pick up the torch where Cy Simonson gave, a, I think it was, it was a two part Eclipse presentation. So we'll have something later this year to accompany that as well. Uh, we plan to host some uh, workshops for some DIY filter making that will probably not be um, a monthly topic, probably be a special function. And there's also been interest to supplement that with live demos, possibly at Tandy Hills or some of the state parks, and kind of do some outdoors hands-on CR equipment, and not just for club members, open this to guests and new members and practice before the big day. Uh, continuing with get, going back to our sibling clubs. Uh-oh, oh, I thought I was breaking up there. I get back with our sibling clubs. We're, we've been working with some reciprocal partnerships down in South Texas and Central Texas. Should there be inclement weather that comes one site, we'll have a reciprocal invitation come over to the backup observing site. Uh, if I believe Chris had invited to the general membership. He has our, our private land uh, in, in Grandview, Texas. Again, right now, we do not plan to host any specific locations or functions that does not preclude anything from developing between now and then. Again, both eclipses, the October one this year and then the April. Oh, big point about the October one, Patrick brought to my attention our recurring monthly Dinosaur Valley event this year in October coincides with the annular eclipse. Now we, of course, if you've seen the map, we are not on the center line, but I think we're at 85% coverage or more, and if spring break was any indication two weeks ago, it will be a full house. So we're planning accordingly. And let's see, uh, touching back on reaching out to your local municipalities, um, Several of us, so I don't know if we were the impetus of uh, making the rounds with our, with our neighbors down in South Texas, down in the hill country, where if you've studied those two maps, the intersection of the annular and the total, down by Kerrville, that region southwest of San Antonio, they actually created some task forces that divvied out by counties. And all of their municipalities are completely prepared at, at all levels. Uh, up here, North Texas, I think we have yet to catch on to the eclipse fever, uh, but they will, as you say. Uh, they'll, they'll wait till the last couple of months leading up to, uh, let's see, ah, to supplement that, uh, Matt mentioned amateur radio operators. We do have some members that participate in 
uh, radio astronomy. Uh, if you look at anywhere on the path of totality and on the, on the annular eclipses, a lot of emergency services will be seeking out enlisting the assistance of ham radio operators for communications because the, the little subtlety symptoms, your cell phone towers will be clogged up, you will not be able to get texts or messages, everyone will be taking selfies like it's New Year's Eve, live streaming video. Um, fast forward to the day of the event, I'll let Chris chime in if he's got a couple of comments. We've been practicing uh, with web live streaming. There's plans to possibly do multi-site live streaming from along the path here in Texas. So to sum up, everything I said is far from comprehensive. This is just an introductory teaser. Uh, like I say, we do have, we've started a, a loose little army or team of Eclipse uh, outreach that will assist with distribution of Eclipse viewers and planning some events. Uh, we will may solicit anybody who has an interest to join or uh, give any uh, recommendations. Uh, that's all I had at this point in time. Thank you for listening. You'll get, okay. the, you'll get the Eclipse fever soon. All right, then I'll step in um, to, to build on some of it. So first of all, um, I will be doing the Mesnabee Marathon on Friday because that has good weather. I'm also going to be working more on uh, additional streaming. I'm also going to be working on more stuff that's not necessarily live streams, but it's videos. Uh, one of the first things is I'm still in the process of doing the Messier Marathon uh, kind of a teaser video. It's a top 20 objects. Uh, I've got a bunch of images. If anyone has any more images, uh, check the emails. Just please send them to me. If you have e uh, pictures of your equipment, like astrophotography rigs, go ahead and send them to me too. Just send it tonight, that way I can start working on it, I can put it in. Again, it's kind of a teaser video for the club, just a teaser for Mezzi Marathon, and just some of the stuff that we do, some of the images that people have taken. Um, as part of that, I want to do additional content. I have lots of meteorites, so I want to do a series of videos on specific meteorites, talking why they're important, things like that. And then from there, build on and talk about uh, what is really important for the club, what are we doing, um, the kind of information that we can put out. For Sarah, she talked about giving out the business cards that have the QR codes. That's fantastic. We can do QR codes which point directly to a video on the YouTube site that I will be working on and it will talk about um, information about the eclipse. So it'll be safety information in a video form. It will be what to do on the day of the event, how to plan for it. We can even do stuff like, hey, talk to your neighbors, get together, do this. Um, the whole idea is put as much information out as quickly as we can. It ain't a lot of time. I don't know if you all have noticed. And it kind of when Juan was saying that we started on this a while ago, we started on this before the pandemic, about 2019, almost about 2018. Um, we talked with the Hill Country astronomers. Uh, Juan and I did a, um, uh, a Zoom meeting with them and talked about what we want to do. I actually mailed them a meteorite uh, as a goodwill gesture slash bribe to remember us. So they, they, still, they still do. Uh, we talked with the club in Waco, the Central Texas Astronomers, Astronomical Society. Uh, they're, they're actually doing something uh, for their members at their observatory because the center line goes roughly uh, close by there. So, um, but they're not planning anything yet at this moment, kind of the outreach events around, uh, around the town. Like Juan said, Hill Country is all in, so they already have plans. I've talked with them this past week about the reciprocal agreements. The whole idea is that if we have bad weather, they have places for us to go. If they have bad weather, they have places uh, up here where they can go. Uh, my family land on Grandview, in Grandview, is going to be open for the club. So we have, it's about 30 acres total, but usable that we can actually do stuff on is about 10 acres. So it's plenty of land to, to go around. We're going to have power. We're going to have, um, th there's, there'll be wireless internet, uh, probably not a huge amount of bandwidth, but it, it's, there'll be something. Um, and, because uh, it's my cousins, uh, he, he's got a big old brick-fired pizza oven, and he got a 
uh, so he can make like lots of pizzas. And he also found one of those um, conveyor belt pizza ovens that you find at like uh, Pizza Hut for 500 bucks. And so he can put out one pizza every seven minutes or less and just like, just go through the line. So there'll be plenty of food. Uh, and because it's Texas, we can do barbecue too. So we do plan on having the possibility of some visitors. I've been in touch with someone um, from California. There is actually a group of eclipse hunters that are coming to the States. He got in touch with me through the Instagram site that I started for the club, uh, which I haven't posted anything to, but he chatted with me while I was actually in the backyard doing some astronomy, and I figured it's just easier to call. So I talked to him for about an hour while I was trying to do my imaging and setup. Um, there's about, he said it's like between, I think, 25 and 40 eclipse chasers from Europe coming to the U.S. They need a place to go. They don't really want to go to Mexico because, well, there are issues. Uh, Durango is the best place to go, but it's the middle of nowhere, and there aren't that many services. In Texas, there's quite a bit. DFW is going to be a major hub. It's pretty much going to be DFW and Austin. Um, San Antonio doesn't really have the big international airport that DFW is. So people are going to be coming here and then scattering. So if they come here, the idea is if we've got the good weather, I will have a place for club members. I will have a place for visiting astronomers to come and, and observe with us, set up their scopes. We're going to have power. We're going to have pizza. We're going to have barbecue. It's a good deal. If we have inclement weather, if we have clouds, rain, whatever, it's not ideal, hopefully Hill Country astronomers will have places for us to go. I already have a list of uh, places that they recommend I contact, specifically looking at state parks down in South Texas, uh, Gardner, Lost Maples, and a couple of others. Those guys are going to be on the center line, and the advantage is they're already planning events. So I need to talk to them, to the superintendents of the park, and say, this is what I need. Because my plan in October is to do a live stream. I don't plan on being out there for like five hours in the middle of the sun, you know, getting nice and burned even in October. And, but I do plan to do like at least two to three hours of a live stream talking about why this is important as a preparation and practice run for doing uh, April. So for April is going to be the big thing. Juan and I um, got in with the Eclipse uh, Ambassadors Program. This is kind of a continuation of, I don't know if you all remember, but I did the uh, Eclipse Mega Movie back in 2017. So it's a continuation. It's a lot of the same members. It's a lot of the same administrators. Um, and it's basically the same thing, except it's not really making a movie because, well, on Sarah's map, we saw a lot of clouds. So that's not going to make a very good movie. But we, the idea behind the Eclipse Ambassadors is what Sarah's doing writ large. It's groups of people around the country, not necessarily on the center line. We're just kind of lucky that way. But it's people going to their neighborhoods, their friends, families, organizations, talking about what's going on, passing out the information. It's young people, middle-aged people, it's older people, it's all sorts. I got on a chat with like three other kids. I've got socks older than some of them, okay? They're college kids. So it is what it is. And it's absolutely fantastic that they're getting involved. Um, what else is there? So in April, I want to do a full live stream. And part of what they talked about for the Eclipse Ambassadors program is um, there is going to be a nationwide live stream going on. And they want to get feeds from different locations. So it's all technical stuff. I should be able to connect into whatever they're doing, uh, push out a live, a live feed to YouTube, split it up between whatever they're doing, um, just get as much out there as I can. And I don't want to be alone. It really sucks when you're streaming alone because you spend hours talking to yourself and I am not enamored with the sound of my own voice, despite what it sounds like right now. <laughs> Anyhow, so um, it's a lot better when you have a crowd. In 2017, we were at a vineyard in Nebraska. There were probably 200-something people around there. It was fantastic. It was loud. Everyone was having a good time because it was a winery. 
Uh, this time around, down in Fredericksburg, lots of other wineries, they have lots of stuff going on. Um, I've already talked with a couple places down there. They have events. I'm looking for some place that has power, that has good internet, not necessarily wireless. I want wired. I can plug right in. And um, I don't mind putting on a show. I am an introvert, despite what my wife thinks, despite what it appears to be. Um, but I can put on a show f for whatever. And advertising the club is an important part of it. So I can't think of anything else. Any questions? Have I just gone on too long? We got 20 minutes left in the meeting. They'll get excited soon. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's coming so fast. And the, um, the pandemic really hobbled us. We were, we were going gangbusters right around 2000. And then right when this hit, it was just, now everything goes dead. Everything was dead. Uh, Sarah and I actually talked about going to the Fort Worth City Council. I don't know if you remember. We go to City Council. Everyone gets five minutes to talk. So pl if you plan it out properly, you can get a number of people. And the first person comes in and says, I'm with the club. Blah, 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 blah. This is what's important about the eclipse. Don't stare at it. And then they give their five minutes. The next person comes in, and they pick up where the first person left off. And you keep going. Third person comes in, picks up where the second person left off, and you don't have to repeat information. You can have a nice 20, 30-minute presentation on everything. You just get a multiple people to do it, and hopefully the city council doesn't say, yeah, 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 okay. Y'all are actually one person, one organization, and, and you know, you're eating up everyone else's time, which is fantastic. That's what I want to do because it's important. Anything else, or am I done? I'm done. Cool. <laughs> Whoo! Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Juan. Thank you, Chris. Especially for st stopping. <laughs> <laughs> I kid. I kid. No, this is great. Um, it's a lot to think about. It's a lot for all of us to, to consider, and this really kind of sparks the big conversation about this. It really is going to be here before we know it. Um, I was in Madras, Oregon, tiny little town in Oregon in 2017, and it was a madhouse. And it's just a little two-horse town up there, and it was crazy. Okay, so we're going to do just like a short five-minute break. I do want to remind everybody that Robin has uh, raffle tickets for sale for the open house. Mm -hmm. For the open house. Uh, the raffle tickets are how much? They are one for 10 and five for 40. One for 10 and five for 40. So they're still for sale. You can get them here tonight. And uh, if you want to buy raffle tickets for our drawing, then um, do that too. But let's give ourselves five minutes, and we'll see you in five minutes. Turn, turn back. 
around 25 feet outside Wall of house. Yeah. 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 Yeah, no, just take it from yeah. the back side of this house. Um, yeah. It was an old house and it was all rotted out and stuff. Oh, they wanted to play with the kids. Uh, so they were just playing with the kids. It's 25 feet off the outside wall. They had to tear it out. Supporting structures, tear it down the walls, windows, doors, put up a new wall, and put up the doors. <laughs> Luckily, my son knows how to do this. Fine stuff. That's the hard part. Actually, not. The devil took one day. The devil, the devil took one day. He just threw it. The saw's on it. Throw it into a throw it into the uh, All right, let's draw raffle tickets. All right, two nine five zero five two eight. Two nine five zero five two eight. Got it? All right. How many do I draw? Three? Three? Okay. All right. Two nine five zero five three two. Zero five three two. Anybody? All right. Last chance, last chance. All right. Okay, let's see. Two nine five zero five three seven. All right.
and 29505530 It's going to be something already drawn or somebody somebody else had that one I see. Push the button. You got grandkids? Awesome. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Am I just not? Okay, 2950536. already know that that one's already been turned in. Oh, good Lord. Okay, 2950529. All right, I'm going to do one more. All right. We can do this all night. Yeah. 29505444. Did you? Oh, huh. what? What? Okay. <laughs> Are we done? We're done. We're done. Okay. Okay. For the business meeting, um, John, let me give you the microphone for the financial report. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, we're going to go through this. Uh, Quasi quickly. <clears throat> I wanted to uh, make a comment here on those numbers. So the numbers themselves, typically the checking is what we use to run, quote, the business. So that's where we pay insurance, we pay e group, we pay um, whatever, whoever else we pay. <clears throat> whereas the savings account has typically been used for property acquisition and maintenance. So right now, that 13000 that you're seeing there is about $3,400 overstated because we haven't, we've, when we pay for things, it's always through a vehicle that comes out of checking. So in order to get things to come out, look right, I have to transfer money from savings over to checking. Just so you know. That's what that little notation is down there under expenses. Um, as of today, we're sitting at 189 people, which is the highest that we've been in a very long time. So uh, kudos for everybody that works to educate and uh, share your knowledge with people that makes them want to come and join our merry band of stargazers. Uh, we do have, uh, uh, unfortunately, we didn't mention all the people that were, that had joined since the last meeting. Uh, Gwasalski and family, um, Alan Rhodes, uh, Tom McClebley, Kelve, excuse me, <laughs> and family, uh, Steve Miller and family, uh, Raj Guru, are you here tonight by any chance? In-house? No? Okay. What about uh, Andy Elgin, are you in-house? Okay. I have your badges and they'll be put in the mail tomorrow. Um, so that's where we are with all the wonderfulness about membership. Hopefully, by the time renewal time comes up, the method of doing yearly will change and it will go from fiscal year to date of membership. And that'll be a big change. <clears throat> uh, what else? Oh, is Nazarene here? No Nazarene either? Okay, nobody's here that I need to talk to. How about Stuart Johnson? Crickets, okay. Oh. 
you, you don't count, Robert. <laughs> Uh, uh, Robert's company uh, that he works for is actually making a nice donation to us of uh, 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 pipe material to make piers with. So thank you to Robert and his company. Um, I think that's all I have. All right. Thank you. What's next? I can't read that. <laughs> Infrastructure and marketing. Does anybody have anything to report on that? Or anybody online? No. Okay. Thank you very much. And does anybody have any other business? Well, thank you. What? Oh. Rock. I was just up there. Huh? I want to make a motion to adjourn the meeting. Thank you for bearing with me. Have a good evening.